From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. It's Friday, and uh, here we are again. Uh, this week, we are pleased to have company on the show. You guys get tired of just watching me, I'm sure. Even though I am funny as hell, it's just it gets old just watching the same goddamn guy every single time. So we've asked our friend Mike Israel to be with us today. Mike is uh, holds a Ph.D. in sports physiology and several other fields of expertise and you may know him from renaissance periodization his company renaissanceperiodization.com is his website mike does a lot of stuff that kind of parallels some of the things we do he specializes in in programming but more so nutrition than uh we do we don't hardly deal with nutrition because our primary emphasis is dealing with novices and uh people for whom nutrition is a less critical component of their training. Uh, Mike deals with more advanced lifters and athletes and bodybuilders uh, for whom nutrition becomes very, very critical. And uh, this is one of his fields of specialty, and we're uh, happy to have him with us today. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Well, thanks for having me on the show. It's an honor. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, why don't you, let's start off by giving people a little bit of a, a picture of your background in terms of where you're from and your educational background and your your uh, competitive history. Sure, thanks. So I was born in Moscow, Russia in uh, 1984. And in 1991, when I was seven years old, uh, my family decided it was time to escape communism as fast as possible. And we came to the United States. And I grew up in uh, Metro Detroit, and then I went to undergrad at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, master's program at Appalachian State University in North Carolina, and did one year of personal training in New York City, and then went and did my PhD in sport physiology and performance at East Tennessee State University under Dr. Michael Stone. So you were at uh, A State with, with Stone at the same time, right? I wasn't. No, I caught him later. Uh, oh, he was, okay. He had just left He'd already moved, a year or I guess. Before. Right. Right. But he I heard things. Time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, I took uh, my first USA, uh, well, it was at the time it was U.S. Uh, Weightlifting Federation, USWF certification with him. At the time, those guys were doing a pretty good job. They've kind of laid down over the years. But at the time, we had a week-long curriculum at the uh, uh, Olympic Training Center, and uh, – Stone ran that program, and it was quite an intense week of pretty thorough education about Olympic weightlifting, and uh, I had met him there. I hadn't really seen him since then, but uh, uh, he's a very well-respected guy. Uh, I respected him more as uh, an academic because he was a lifter. Sure. And uh, I... I find it easier to listen to people tell me things if they actually know firsthand what the hell they're talking about. And lots and lots of people don't. And we'll yeah, get, we'll get to that later. <laughs> for sure. I sought him out because he, um, he had walked the walk as himself a lifter and coached a ton of lifters. And, uh, you know, he had gone as far as his body was capable of going, which is mm -hmm. really, really good. And then he, of course, took the academic route as well to about as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. And that was really cool. You know, people, a lot of people can speak in hypotheticals. He didn't have to because he spoke right. from a real experience with tons and tons of people, including himself. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was really, it was uh, pretty special to be able to learn from him. And you know, of course we didn't always agree on everything, but I don't think, uh, doc's the kind of guy you always agree with on stuff. <laughs> so, no, probably not. uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was really neat. And, I remember one of my uh, sort of revelations came when uh, I went over and there was the first day of the PhD program and we had a whole meeting with everyone who was in the program 
And he said, it's kind of a funny time to say this, but he goes, if you're here to figure out how to make people healthier, if you're here for adult fitness or if you're here for injury prevention, you're in the wrong place. We're here to teach you how to take good athletes and make them as good as possible. And he's like, if you're here for any other reason, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm finally where I want to be because a lot of people mm -hmm. in their schooling for a long time, you know, most people, I think a lot of people who follow starting strength, when they begin their education with the intent of becoming something like a strength and conditioning coach or something, that's really what they want to do is take uh, folks and enhance their athletic performance. But a lot of times the schooling really doesn't teach you that until way late in the game or ever. So they're, or they're ever. kind of disappointed. Right. Yeah. So. They just teach you the basics to sort of like a, a pre-medical education. Mm -hmm. And then you're supposed to sort of know how to train people after that. And sometimes that doesn't always happen. <laughs> Luckily, my PhD, right, like my PhD was exactly specifically only to do with enhancing athletic performance. So it was right. really, really just a very special. Well, that makes PhD it a different course. type of degree than the vast majority of people walking around with ex-phys degrees. Uh, we, we see people with ex-phys degrees all the time come through our program at the seminar and uh, they haven't got the slightest idea what we're doing. And uh, I mean, I mean, we've had masters people come through with you know what a lot of times ends up being a terminal degree, terminal degree in ex phys is a master's degree, and uh, not not know anything about what we're talking about. They've had no preparation in actual you know barbell type strength training. And that's what we're there to learn how to do. And I, we hear all the time from people with master's degrees, I've learned more this weekend than I have in my six years of, of college about what you guys are doing. And we all understand the importance of, the, of understanding the basic physiology of uh, not just exercise, but of muscle contraction and all of the other things that we deal with. Uh, but they... A lot of people walking around with a master's in ex phys really honestly think they're able to coach people because they've been told that they are. But when you get them in the gym on the platform, they're helpless. They have no idea how to coach any of the basic barbell exercises. And um, it's it's good that we know how to show them quickly. And, you know, they leave in a in a position to actually do the job that they thought they were prepared to do when they got out of school and they're not. So I'm not, you know, so I've, I've encountered what you're talking about a ton. And I think a lot of that comes down, unfortunately, just to hubris. And, and yes. I don't, so like, you know, I've been a, I am a professor of exercise science and I have been for a while. Uh, and so I deal with students directly and I've gone all the way as far as school goes in this capacity. And, you know, I just, in undergraduate programs, in almost every single one of them, you learn how to actually lift weights zero times. Mm -hmm. In the occasional master's program, you learn how to lift weights in a sort of like demonst demonstrative, theoretical scenario. And, and maybe you'll have one class where you sort of learn how the lifts are executed and you learn a little bit about coaching. Um, our undergraduates at Temple University, where my colleague James Hoffman and I taught, he actually taught a class of like fundamentals of weight training. But like, uh, you know, no one after that class is uh, thinks they're prepared to be coaching folks at any remotely high level. They, that class is designed as a beginning mm -hmm. so that you can start exploring your own technique and uh, then after building up years and years of your own practice, you can maybe start to help others. It's literally an introduction to the process. It's not right. like a stamp to say, here you go, teach other people stuff. So I think when people think that they've graduated from a degree um, in exercise science or exercise physiology or whatever, I think that's kind of like a sort of cockiness that they assume, uh, you know, co hubris, cockiness, I'm not sure what to call yeah. it, an intellectual kind of uh, righteousness to think like, oh, exercise, I know this. Right? But in reality, if you really come down to it, they, they don't actually know it. And, and they could have, in a more honest mindset, uh, told you that they, they didn't know it. It's kind of like people who, um, you know, I've had this every now and again, and I'm, I'm not sure to get in too much of this, although we, we can if you'd like. I, uh, 
I'm a big uh, sort of uh, dilettante in economics. Like it's a really big passion of mine to just yes. learn a ton of economics on the side just for fun. Right. And every now and again, you'll run into academic economists, so to speak, although they're not publishing. The people with undergraduate degrees or master's degrees, usually undergrad degrees in economics. And they just got that degree um, so they could go work at a bank or they could go, well, you know, business school or something. And because they got an undergraduate degree in economics, they sort of assume they know kind of everything there is to know about economics compared to a regular untrained person. And I'll start to engage them in a, you know, maybe like this is a, a discussion over the internet about price controls or uh, about labor markets or something. And I'll ask them a few questions and it'll be like, well, in my economics degree, and I'll be like, okay, can you explain that? And they can't. And right. I'm like, so can you explain to me supply and demand? And like, they sort of like supply and demand. They sort of remember doing the equations and demand curves and flexibility and all that stuff, but they don't really know that specific thing because they were never really taught those general concepts in a ton of specificity. They were taught a couple of skill sets that were going to be useful in business school. So in the same way, I think a lot of people with exercise science degrees just kind of make the assumption like, oh, it has to do with exercise. Uh, I know it. I know it. But really they don't. And if they were honest, they would say, mm -hmm. look, I've never been taught to coach for me. Right. And thus, why would I know it? And then it'd be well, more open-minded to learning. You know, that's an interesting interesting analogy because it is exactly parallel to the experience we have with people coming out of school uh, from an exercise physiology degree they 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 have the academics and they've had the classes and they understand what ATP does and they understand the 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 economics of muscle contraction but having never done it themselves, having never done anything that actually uses that information, they completely lack the other entire half of the equation. Uh, a bachelor's degree in economics has probably never run a business. And they don't actually know about supply and demand. They don't know about what to pay employees and how payroll affects the bottom line and all this other stuff that they think they know. And until they actually get some concrete real world experience, they don't know anything about economics. And the same is true with ex phys degrees. Uh, these kids come out of school. Uh, they've been hell. The program might even have been rigorous, sure. but go over there and show me what is wrong with that guy's deadlift right now. And, they have no idea what I'm talking about because, because they've, they've never, never done it, it themselves. They've never deadlifted themselves and they've never taught anybody to deadlift. They've never thought about what makes a correct deadlift different from an incorrect deadlift. It's never occurred to them. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, this is kind of a teaching barbell training is, uh, most properly an apprenticeship based program. It really is. Uh, I think that uh, uh, a good coach ought to have at least tried to read through Brooks and Fahey. All right. I, in school, you, they should be. Anyway. They, they should, even if they're not in school, you can read yeah. Brooks and Fahey. You can go get a general physiology text. You can read the general physiology text, and then you can get Brooks and Fahey. And you can understand the vast majority of that. And if you have that as your background, it kind of doesn't really make that much difference uh, whether you have a piece of paper that says you've read it or not. If you've got the information and you've got a good solid background in first, your own training, and second, in applying the things you've learned under the bar yourself to clients that you're working with, you're so far ahead of a kid with a four-year ex phys degree. You 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 know I I don't care about most of the academics that are involved in an ex phys degree. An ex phys degree, in the absence of having gone through Calc two, is not a science degree. And you know you you just can't call it a science degree. It's Why most of, because they're just most the vast majority of these programs completely lack any academic rigor. They, they really do. You, you've seen these before. I've, you've been associated with uh, better and worse programs. And if a kid is not able to work algebra problems, then he's, he's not got a science degree. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
there's a there's a very big diversity of what qualifies as an exercise science degree, and some folks coming out of some of the these degree programs gee whiz you know they don't know a whole lot of anything no some coming out are pretty sharp a lot of that depends on just the student themselves some students are really smart really diligent and everything that is told to them and that is taught to them they absorb and integrate and think on their own and then they really really are super sharp and can catch on quickly and other students just do sort of whatever it takes to coast by where they're really good at mm -hmm. cramming for tests and at the end of the day they don't have any sort of integrative knowledge that they can sprawl out to other things and i think mm -hmm. that's probably the best way to use a, either a degree or text that you've read on your own is if you teach someone with no physiology knowledge whatsoever about the lifts, they can parrot the lifts back, they can right. learn the system well, but in very novel situations or where creativity is required for their own programming, or let's say an athlete starts to accumulate a lot of fatigue under their training, and they're sort of not exactly sure what fatigue is, what its sources are, how right. to remediate it because they don't know the physiology, they're going to get into a little bit of trouble. So they can yes. be pretty decent coaches, but not creative coaches. What Absolutely. What you can do, yeah, if you know the physiology, you're not ready to coach. But if you know the physiology and then you have lots of time being taught how to coach and lots of practice, at the end of that whole process, not only can you coach very well, but you can adapt your coaching, create novel scenarios, create different programming Absolutely. environments, and, and then and then you're off to go. And it, it, interesting enough, like so right now I'm teaching a, a graduate course in advanced strength and conditioning uh, program design essentially for Lehman College under Brad Schoenfeld, and almost the entire thing is – uh, the principles of training and how to apply them to the beginning of designing programs. And I give very few specifics and very few templates, and I almost never say this is how to design a program. What I do is say, here are the principles of specificity, of overload, of fatigue mm -hmm. management. Here's how biomechanics works in this regard. Now you go build me a program. And then when they start doing that, they actually have to know things. It's very easy for someone to be like, duh, three by five, that's what we're doing. And it's like, okay, why five and not six? Why five and not four? Why three? Why not four sets? Why this? Why that? Why do we squat and deadlift this number of times a week? And there are very right. good answers to those questions, but if they can't even theorize them, like for example, someone could finish a course on uh, of some kind or some uh, apprenticeship in designing programs to say, okay, we squat once a week. And okay, okay, what would happen if we squatted twice a week? And they just don't know the answer to that question. And a good answer to that question could be, as long as the volume load over the week is fine, then it's okay, as long as you accommodate it, as long as you properly separate the sessions, it's fine. Or they could even say, you know, I think squatting two times a week is excessively fatiguing, especially over the long term to various connective tissues, and it's just not a good idea. Any answer, that denotes a higher order of thinking about the systems involved would be right. amazing, but sometimes people give you no answer at all. So I think just like there is a problem in academia of producing people who don't know how to coach but think they know how to coach, there's an equal problem in coaching certifications, usually the real fast ones that you can just take online right. that say like, hey, you know things and you really you just know one way of programming and you don't understand why it's designed that way and thus your ability to alter it or uh, adjust it to the individual is nil and then you sort of have another level of false confidence. And because some of those folks on that side don't know any physiology, when you ask them why, they didn't even know there was a way. It's like asking me about right. computers, like why is Microsoft Excel crashing? I'm like, it's not my job to know that. I just call a phone number and they fix it. So right. the same way, I think the ultimate coach probably knows a decent amount of physiology and anatomy and so on and so forth, but must, must, must have that practical, real world. And I don't know, I'd love to get your opinion on this. Um, I think it, so something we're seeing, and you might have seen this yourself, is people will be very confident in coaching relatively high-level folks or everyone with a profoundly small amount of training under their belt and coaching under their belt. Yes. Uh, and it's always kind of to me like, gee, you know, when I had so little training and coaching, I was coaching soccer moms for free and I was just trying to learn stuff and be right. a better coach. Some folks are very confident, you know, one month after they started coaching or they started training themselves, they're like, I'm taking new clients. And it's like, taking them where? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I, pe people do not understand uh, because there's not just a lot of academic depth in the pedagogy uh, of, uh, of movement science. Uh, people don't understand how very, very important it is that 
when you are coaching an athlete and you are watching the person move in real time on the platform, that what you are essentially doing is filtering what you're seeing through the part of your brain that has done that same movement. You, you have a filter that is being applied to what you're seeing. And if you don't have that filter, then the thing that is, in fact, the movement error being committed in front of you doesn't register as an error. You have no you, idea. You have no idea why that's wrong. You have absolutely no idea, and I can't brag on this video enough. If you go to our website, uh, Dr. Bradford has done a, a very, very important lecture at one of our previous coaching association conventions from years ago called The Coaching Eye. And uh, I'm so proud of this damn thing. It is a, a completely different uh, examination of what movement coaching actually does than has been even discussed about anywhere else. And Mike, I'd really invite you to go look at that. It's, it takes about an hour and, uh, it's a, a completely different insight into, into what a coach is doing when he's standing there on the platform with you than has ever been discussed anywhere before. This is a, she's quite bright. And this is a, excellent synthesis of all this information and uh it it is a it specifically explains why someone with nothing more than a crossfit level one certification under their belt cannot coach anything for anyone because they lack the experience you have to have done this yourself because it literally having doing having done it literally changes the mechanism by which you watch and interpret things. And I, I, it's, it's a terribly important lecture, and I'd invite everyone to look that up. It's called The Coaching Eye, and it's on our website at startingstrength.com. Sounds really good. There's also, like, uh, to me, there's, um, there's another layer that we can discuss about not just the sort of at face value biomechanics of a lift conducted mm -hmm. for several repetitions that of course has its own wisdom and insight that you need to apply. Mm -hmm. But a big thing to me that's often missed by folks, especially people that are academic researchers and their job is to collect undergraduates and do studies on them. And they sort of maybe train and I've worked with plenty of folks like this in the past and maybe they don't train. A lot of them don't train much or at all or sort of a recreational they end up finding something that only really applies to untrained individuals and try to generalize it to trained populations where they yeah. would immediately regard what they're generalizing as absurd on a trained level. So, for example, there are folks that are saying every now and again that, you know, due to the following X, Y, Z studies, deadlifts are no more fatiguing than squats or benches or something like that or no more fatiguing than any other lift right or they'll say things like you know <laughs> if you're if you're recovering at a muscular level uh your ner nervous system recovery measured in whatever capacity is never the limiting factor for lifters so it's not like you know people say oh my cns is fatigued which has its own problems as you know you say my nervous system is fatigued they, they say that that's really not a thing that's more a thing for endurance runners and lifters shouldn't run into that well you know, I don't think those folks ever tried, and I have tried a few times, to do a mesocycle of five to six weeks of accumulating load, sometimes accumulating volume, twice a week hard deadlifting, sets of five to ten. Mm -hmm. It's going to fatigue you in a way that is qualitatively different than anything else. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. just have and, to feel and it. If you haven't experienced that, you just th – th again, if, it's, if everything you know is on paper – then you don't really know anything. And, you know and very little. <laughs> those of us that have actually, uh, the be it, it's been my experience that the best coaches are mediocre physical specimens that tried really, really, really hard to get struggled good. Struggled for years. Struggled and learned from the struggle. Uh, the easiest people to coach are obviously genetic freak uh, talented athletes, you know, the guys with 38 inch verticals, you know, they're not hard to coach. And furthermore, guys like that are not going to have to learn to solve the problems that guys like me 
extremely average people that wanted it real, real bad and just were hard-headed and kept fighting and learning and fighting and learning, uh, end up knowing. But the harder it is to learn something, the more trouble it is to learn something. The more you learn about it and the better it sticks. Yeah, and the more you have an ability to help people that are also absolutely, You know, absolutely. teaching someone who learns everything like a sponge – you're really like, no, you're not really teaching. You're just saying stuff. Right. Teaching is an art. You're just form. you're giving them something to copy. Right. You're not I teaching remember. them anything. They can learn very well visually, and yeah. the the easiest the easiest job, and we say this all the time, easiest job in strength and conditioning is on the strength and conditioning staffs at D one and pro teams because yeah. they're not dealing with anybody except freaks who learn visually, they don't have to know their jobs. They don't, so, they, those guys are already strong. They're well, already so. explosive and fast. They already yeah. learn visually. You don't, and by extension, if, if the general public judges your ability as a strength coach from the performance of these guys, you're going to look like a genius every sure. single time. Sure, yeah. Every single time. That's where the money comes from, you know. My, That's, uh, experience was uh, I got an interesting story about this exact thing so when I was uh, a sports scientist at ETSU getting my PhD we were all strength coaches as well and that's ETSU is D1 so it was one particular girl that I was coaching she was a volleyball player scholarship she had also gotten tons of full ride scholarships to go play basketball at a ton of schools she just chose volleyball because it was the best deal and she liked it right so this is a person that was good at pretty much every single physical task she had ever had to do her entire life. It don't just mean good, like all county in everything, just the best. She's right? a physical genius, as we 100%. say. So I remember one time I was trying to teach her how to do a stiff legged deadlift properly. And I'm a huge stickler on technique. You know, if your back's rounding or your, your knees are coming forward, it's no bueno, all this other stuff. And I taught her to do the perfect stiff legged deadlift in one repetition. She looked at me doing it once. And then she just did it. And, you know, it's rare for us as coaches. Because right. what do we do as coaches? When an athlete does something, we kind of like secretly want to have some corrections. We're like, ooh, that's really good. But what you need to do, imagine how kind of stupid you look as a coach or brilliant if, like, the athlete does it. And you're like, that's it. Like, I literally have nothing mm -hmm. to tell you. That was flawless. And right. then – that same person who was actually a, a really great student as well, she ended up going and coaching volleyball players in strength and conditioning later as part of an internship, but she went to an NAIA school. And she came to me at one point and was like, I have no, I, I'm struggling because I'm trying to teach these girls how to do the movements. And I had no idea you're able to screw up a movement this bad. And I was like, right. aha. She didn't know there was a problem to solve because she'd never had a problem. This is this is the this uh, this is such a big gigantic problem in modern strength and conditioning. Uh, coaching staffs uh, at these high level schools uh, that they are, they've got two problems. Either they themselves are extremely good athletes and have never had problems to solve, or they themselves don't have any experience dealing with people who have problems to solve and have never learned to solve them. The people that know the most about coaching barbell training are the people that coach 45 year old real estate brokers, people of average physical capacity, because these are the problems. These are the people with the problems that you as the coach have to learn how to solve. And if you've never learned how to solve them, you just don't know. Yeah. If you rely on the expertise of the recruiter to put 55 physical freaks in the locker room, there is hardly any way that after you having dealt with these people for three years doing everything wrong, they're going to be better anyway. Yeah. Because they went from 18 years old to 21 years old. Yeah. And they yeah. worked hard they and they got up. stronger and they're, 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 they're they're geniuses anyway. And this is what is wrong with modern strength and conditioning being predicated on, on all this, uh, all these different physical movements that are merely displays of athletic ability. Yeah. Those kids don't develop athletic ability. They've already got athletic ability or they wouldn't be in the program. 
What you don't know how to do is make this genetic freak stronger by lifting heavier weights because you don't know how to teach them how to lift heavier weights. You don't know how to program that stuff. And it's much easier to show them a new exercise today with a one pound or with a five pound dumbbell on an unstable surface than it is to, to spend the time getting these kids from a 275 deadlift to a 495 deadlift. Yeah. There's another problem there as well that compounds the issue, I think. Um, there is another uh, type of coach that is maybe one of the best types of coaches and knows the most, specifically in this area. It is a coach in a barbell specific sport that deals with what I would describe as free agent athletes, mm -hmm. uh, like a powerlifting coach, something like someone like one of my friends, uh, Chad Wesley Smith. So someone like that, people is a very, very high, highly regarded coach. He's coached a ton of world team members, world record holders, et cetera, et cetera, in powerlifting specifically. And mm -hmm. his colleague, Max Ada, has coached them in weightlifting. And what ends up happening with these guys is they're the guys uh, you come to when you're already really good, yes. but you're not the best and you want to be the best and they have an incredible challenge because anyone can take an, an unreal talented athlete and just sort of like like you sort of intimated, watch them blossom into what they would be anyway. Right. But when everyone around you is a talented athlete and they're competing against each other, it just being amazing doesn't quite cut it. So then that coach has to take amazing and take it to the next level. At that point, not everything works. You can't take talent for granted because talent isn't good enough. What ends up happening, unfortunately, so in the private arena, that tends to happen, and coaches like that tend to rise to the top. Unfortunately, in strength and conditioning coaching, you have at least two things formal. Let's just talk about formal football strength and conditioning in the United States. I'm sure you're quite familiar with it. Mm -hmm. There are two additional problems that I can foresee. One is there's a huge incentive I would say in some cases disincentive because it goes out of whack to just don't get them hurt. Just don't get them hurt. Right. And the risk to reward goes out the window and you're like, why are we going to push these guys in the gym? If I can just rely on them being awesome already, not get them hurt because the coach will fire me. Well, and then you're describing a, sudden, a pro coach. You're describing S&C at the babysitter. professional level. It's babysitting. hundred percent. And then in addition to that, you have a misunderstanding of the role of strength development at the very top of athletic directors and sport coaches that hire these coaches. And a lot of times they'll hire coaches for really uh, not great reasons. Like this isn't a guy that can get my guys violently strong while keeping them reasonably safe. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that I knew in my undergrad program, or this is a guy that's a great motivator, or this is a guy that's right. a great team kind of guy. They'll listen to the coach and so on and so forth. And a lot of times you get this old boys club mentality where there's neither the the incentive to push the guys hard and try to really figure out how to make people strong nor is there like it, nor is that reflected in hiring because you, if you can imagine if you are hiring a weightlifting coach for the united states of america a real barbell sport where free asian athletes come and try to get as strong as possible if you were hiring that coach you would probably if you were the president of the united states or something uh, who ostensibly hires these people right you would be like okay i've got a bunch of coaches which one of these guys has the track record that actually has made amazing athletes even more amazing. That's what I want. Yeah. But when you look at football strength and conditioning, that's not what you're looking at. You're not even looking at like how the athletes begin and end in their program. Mark, who the fuck? Uh, can I swear in here? Well, I hope you do. God almighty. Just, who, the the, <laughs> who the fuck thinks that who? just because you have got great athletes in your locker room that the guy – that is standing there while these great athletes are wandering through the, the locker room is responsible for them being great athletes. Right. And Do there's also the question of when has there been a demonstration among these coaches you're hiring of uh, here's some science, take their athletes at freshman year, take their athletes at uh, senior year or when they go do the combine and see what the change in rate of what, strength what is. What is the change relative to what change. would have changed anyway just due to four years of maturation? Sure. We could take a, a we could take a kid with a that walks in the gym with uh let's say he's 5'10, he weighs 185 pounds with a 36 inch vertical and he's going to show me 
on day one, untrained to 275 deadlift because guys with big verticals walk in stronger for obvious reasons. And every single time I can have that guy at a five plate deadlift in six months. Sure. How often, and that's not, that's baseline. That's baseline. But how often is that demonstrated at the D1 and pro level? This, you've got that kind of genetics, and you yep. absolutely refuse to develop that kid from 275 to 495 because you don't think it's necessary. Yeah. And there it's, are there are really – It's there inexcusable. Really, yeah, there are some really, really good coaches at that level, but – they don't rise to the top because the people hiring those coaches, they're not looking for those good coaches. They're looking a lot of times for sort of old boys club type of right. stuff that just don't get them hurt kind of crowd. I mean, if, if I was hiring anyone for anything, I would be curious, how do your results compare to those of your competitors that I could hire? Right. Do you get the job done in a more impressive fashion? I would look at two things easy if I was an athletic director. When you were at your school earlier, let's say uh, I'm interviewing a coach. Okay, all of your athletes that you had at your school, what were their starting numbers for lifts? What were their ending numbers for lifts? And I would ask this, all the coaches that I interviewed the same questions, right. and I would expect data, and they would have to prove to me like how much better are Absolutely. you making athletes. And the the weight on is, the bar doesn't lie, does it? Yep. Yeah, Hundred percent. And then the second thing I would ask is, what? Let me see the injury statistics on all those folks as well. Yes. The person with the best ratio of getting athletes to improve versus injury rates relatively low. That's that motherfucker. I'm probably going to look at you know top three of, candidates, and then course. we'll see who I get along with best. But right. I'm hiring you for a result, and a lot of times the result really like oh everyone kind of in strength and conditioning in the football world. A lot of times people sort of assume like oh yeah no you know you've been around a weight room, you've trained with good guys, you sort of know how this works. Now let's talk about the team building aspect or the fact <laughs> that you're not going to a bunch of sports psychology shit. So sure. yeah, if you don't, or if you're asked that question. And your response to it is, well, it, you know, we didn't try to make their deadlift go up. We didn't try to make the oh. squad go up. We're trying to improve their rate of force development. Show me some numbers on that. Fire him. Get him yeah. out of the interview. It's no, you, you don't understand anything about this. And, so, yeah. you know, that's a, that's an excellent, that's an excellent point. If, if you're trying to hire a strength and conditioning coach, can he demonstrate to you that he actually knows how to make the kids stronger? And if he can't demonstrate it, then he doesn't know well, because he hasn't level. assigned any importance to having done so. Yeah. And there's another level to that. So I've been privy to many, many conversations where people have said that, like I've been in, in weight rooms where they're like, you know, we're not trying to make power lifters here. We're trying to make athletes. We care about the vertical <laughs> jump. We care about the rate of force development. How many thousands yeah. of times I've heard that over the past sure. 40 years you have. You have it's no idea. Too, oh, I'm sure. So but to me, two questions immediately come up in my head. One, do you have good data to show you're actually making people more explosive? Because fucking around on a BOSU ball doesn't actually make them more explosive. No, no. And then two, have you not seen the 40-year literature that for athletes of an intermediate to advanced training age or early advanced, making them, especially ones that are relatively weak compared to what their genetic potential is, that making them stronger is perhaps the biggest factor in making them more explosive. And that's just so arithmetic. Be, right, that's just like, arithmetic. And yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's so easy to demonstrate that this is nothing but a, If I take a kid with a 22-inch vertical and I take his squat from – 155 to 405 what have i done to his power having made him no more explosive i have increased his power significantly significantly i can't make him i can't take a 22 inch vertical and turn it into a 32 inch vertical that can't be done but i can take a weak 22 and make a strong 22 and improve his power and also i mean you know, if you make that big of an enhancement in his lifting ability, assuming that, so let's assume <laughs> it's a little bit of a physics conundrum, but he's putting force into the ground for a certain amount of time in yes. the uh, phase of the jump in which you actually get propelled. He's going to be putting so much more force. He's probably going to have a higher <laughs> exit velocity, assuming he didn't just gain 80 pounds of body fat in addition to that. Right. So, yeah, I don't, I don't understand how these people can be th this bad at their jobs. 
Yeah. You know, if I was as bad at my job of educating people about this shit as these guys are, they are quite effectively avoiding the one thing, the most important variable they have influence over, force, force production. The most important variable they have influence over. And they're over here messing around with the one that is the least trainable. Yeah, which is sexy. Yeah, it it's is. It's not going to get them hurt. And right. It looks cool for the coach. It doesn't make it, the You know, the coach. athletic director comes down and he sees him doing athletic Ooh. looking shit in the weight room. And yeah. he thinks, man, Athlete. we hired the right guy. Yeah, 100%. We've got athletes. Well, the, the goddamn recruiter put the athletes there. For sure, for sure. And all you guys are doing is demonstrating the talent that the recruiter saw. Yeah, there's yeah. a there's a bit of nuance there at the very edges where just to make sure we steel man the alternate position. Yes, when athletes get exceptionally strong, close to their genetic potential after mm -hmm. three or four years of training or whatever. Right. Not not that the two are the same. Close to whatever potential they had in three or four years of training. Right. When they get very strong, let's say you have an athlete that's now a 600 pound to depth squatter, which right. as you and I know is much rarer than people think. Oh God, every, yes. Everyone and their mom supposedly squats 600 at a D1 school. Right. I've been a strength coach at plenty of D1 schools. I saw the shit like one or two times, right? For many right. honest people. So. A true 600 pound squatter, let's say now they're adding very small amounts of weight to their squat and you have to go to strategies like teaching them to really reinforce their bracing, starting mm -hmm. to get away from the athletic stance of squatting and modifying their stance just so that they can squat more. Sure. Yeah, now we're talking about trade-offs and maybe for those people starting to get roughly stable, still increasing squat strength, but more slowly and prioritizing more towards explosive drills, towards plyometrics, towards other modalities in order to take that raw strength and milk it out as much as possible with more power, more power training, not exclusively. There's absolutely an argument for that. And that's a totally great point. The problem is motherfuckers pretend that the asshole squatting 315 are the ones that are ready for this plyometric power type right. shit. Right, exactly. You're ready for that shit when you're brutal Brutally strong, but until you get brutally strong, you just get better at the explosiveness if you get stronger. Right. And a lot of people want to pretend it's the other way around. Well, and it's and because it's easier, because it's easier to come up with drills, with foot drills for the players, than it is to say I need five more pounds today on the squat than you gave me Monday. The players also don't bitch about it as much. The players yeah. bitch less. Right. Yeah, the players bitch less. But, you know, look, we'll find somebody else that wants a scholarship. You know, you can tell them that, but when they're the expensive players, man, I've, I tell you what, I've seen all kinds of stuff, man. I've seen a star quarterback being trained only by the head strength and conditioning coach and training meant that he was doing bullshit BOSU ball crap mm -hmm. just because right. the SNC coach didn't want him to complain, didn't want to get him hurt. It was just <laughs> like this prize pony that like, oh, oh, okay, here's we're gonna halter do horse. Part. He's right? a halter then, horse. A hundred percent. And it was it was one of these things where it's like, okay, like mm. it's nice that this guy feels like he's getting the royal treatment. But if maybe someone else was in that position of strength and conditioning coach, this is a guy that was going to go pro, like, had a good chance at going pro. Mm -hmm. But based on how he turned out at the end of his collegiate career, he was either going to go pro pro or like, you know, one one season on the, you know, the practice squad with the Seahawks and then you're out kind of pro. Right. right? So when that kid is in that position, I think it's worth for a strength and conditioning coach because it's I'll say this, the pro team different discussion, but collegiate, if you're dealing with real good talent that has the ability to go pro and you milk them out for your own purposes. So you say, okay, I'm as a coach, it's no good for me to put this person to get injured ever, but it's, but they're already good enough to perform to my ends. So I'm just gonna sort of fucking energy, injury manage them and make sure not to fuck them up and, and be real nice about it. So that I use them for the best. It's, it's, it's almost like a parent milking out their kid for to be the best little leaguer ever. And then, <laughs> cause they don't care about the long-term development and so what their elbow is right. completely dilapidated by the time that they're nine, who cares? It's selfish and it's fucked up. If you're a good yes. strength and conditioning coach at the collegiate level, you sit that football player down, you say, listen here, motherfucker. Maybe you don't swear at them because I don't know if that's uh, allowed anymore at universities. You say, do you want to be the best possible <laughs> football player at the end of this four years to give you the best shot of going pro? And they'll say, of course. They'll be like, yes. Be like, we're going to have to fucking suffer because in the pro ranks, there are giant motherfuckers out there in the field and they're going to try to kill you and end your career. you got to be as strong as possible. Now it's time to suffer. And that person could be, if informed, right. make the right decision. But a lot of times they're never informed. They think 
that the bullshit frou frou stuff is the stuff. The people whose responsibility it is to inform them have never familiarized themselves with the simple process of adding five pounds to the deadlift. Now, as, as, as obvious as this is, you don't see it in D1 schools. You don't see it in D2 schools. You, you certainly don't see it in the pros. Enough. You just very seldom do you have a guy in a position of authority in the weight room that says, your technique is fine, but you've been doing the same weight for six weeks. You, I've, got, I've got to see you working harder or I'm going to replace you. All right, you're you not showing me favorites. that you want to be here enough. Put five more pounds on than you did last time and do the set of five and shut up and get it done and then do it again next time and do it again next time. And it's, it's, it's elegantly simple, but simplicity often eludes people who are trying to impress other people because sure. people are impressed with complexity. And yeah. if the if the if the AD wants to come downstairs and go to the weight room, he wants to see complex looking shit sure. because because that he doesn't know anything about this, and I, he, you know, and you're going to try to impress him with his hire, yeah. And and you know, it's it's going to be hard to explain. Well, but I mean, he's doing the same thing as he was as he did last time I was down here. Yeah, yeah, doctor. But let That's me point out that he's doing for. it with 25 extra pounds on the bar, right? Right. It's, it's almost like saying, you know, oh, they're uh, just doing the same football drills as always. Yeah, we're trying to get good at football, goddammit. Right. What do you think we're going to be doing soccer right. or basketball? Yeah, we're not, doing, um, we're not doing badminton drills here. You know, yeah, we're, we're doing them over and over and over again because that's what makes us good at doing them. Yeah, 100%. Surprise, right? It, Shock. It's, uh, when I was at ETSU, we had uh, the opportunity to coach a bunch of athletes in the weight room. And one thing we used to do that, so my colleague Ashley and I, we were like a team and we would coach a couple of teams together. Uh, she was another, she's a PhD as well. And what we used to do was let the athletes choose their own weights, carte blanche. Like they would just choose their own weights. And it's sort of like where they were taught the basic progression. And you know, mm -hmm. when they felt like it, they'd kind of go up. And what we noticed was Man, a lot of people, some people were just great by themselves, right? We all know those lifters that just, yes. they just want more. and But some of them just were the perfectly fine sloughing off. And especially in season for volleyball or in the preseason when you're practicing a lot or something like that or for women's soccer. I mean, you're kind of beat up psychologically more than anything. And you may not be prone to putting the weight on the bar. But what we did is we stopped that and we started writing in their weights for them. Right. A simple, like precise. Two and a half or five now, we're, now we're training. Yeah. Previously, we were, we were fucking around in the weight room and now we're yeah. training. Yeah. Right. And if they couldn't do it, if the, so if they said the weight's too heavy, two things would happen. Maybe sometimes just one. Thing one would always happen first. We'd go, okay, we'd walk over with them. We'd say, okay, rest another two minutes, and then we'll take this weight again for your set of five that you were supposed to be doing. And I want you to do as good as you can. I, th I think you got this. And they go, okay. They just claimed it was too heavy. Usually, when they got a couple of strength coaches looking at them and a couple teammates, <laughs> they get under it and, and, and just boom, 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 and it's it. Right. And we're like, okay, you're doing great. And then they believe in themselves more and everything's fine. Now, if they have reached their, you know, what I would term maximum recoverable volume or something like that, or they're just way too fatigued, it is clearly, you know, it's possible just by addition of five pounds to exceed the athlete's physiological ability to adapt. It's, sometimes it's just too much. It really right. is. And that, it, it, obviously more of a problem the more the advanced the athlete is. Exactly. So when they <laughs> do do that set and they are actually overreached they get three grinder and then dump it they're supposed to get five we go hey okay no big deal and then we start the fatigue management process giving them a, a nice easy few days mm -hmm. and then start building back up but you got to prove to us that you're not just at the end of your rope psychologically right you got to prove to us that like physiologically something's happening they don't know that they just think right. they're on the spot and nine right. times out of ten they perform and it's you, no big deal you're gonna have to demonstrate to us that. that it's not just because you don't want to 100 percent because that's right. unacceptable at a division one level. We no. would literally tell them that. At this the is your job. Multiple times, you are trying to become a dangerous, wild animal. You're trying to become an inconvenience to people. People don't want you to be strong. We had a lot of the girls on the team towards the end of our uh, time with them, when they would hit the ball, it, it would sound like, like a boom instead of like a slap. And like when you hear that boom in women's volleyball, Everyone else is like, what the fuck is going on? Like, I don't want right. to get hit by that. I can't return that ball. <laughs> Strength is amazing, but 
it's it's a tough road and it's a simple road and it's it's simple and it's fucking monotony and brutality but the people that get the strongest and the most out of it they're the ones that can commit to the two and a half pounds to the five pounds right. there's another thing in my own training because i do bodybuilding training sometimes like a, a couple days ago my training partner and i did smith machine squats we had the two and a halves on top of hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And no doubt people on the internet are like, why the two and a half, bro? Cause motherfucker, we did two and a half less pounds last week and now we're doing two and a half more. How the fuck <laughs> do you think you get up to hat squatting 600? <laughs> Some days you're just like, ah, I'm done doing five plates, I'm gonna right. go do six, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. And it's it's such a simple, obvious thing that uh, the, I'm, I'm gonna argue that the vast majority of the people in strength and conditioning have not learned. They've either not learned it or they don't like it or for some reason they're not using this simple thing that has to be kept in mind. If you are stronger, you are better. And stronger means nothing more than two and a half, five more pounds. That's all it means. Now, the easy, the, the longer you've been training, the harder it is to add that. But you still have to figure out how to do it or you're stuck. And it's crazy, too, because people will pretend that there are some sort of mystical qualities. You know, power training and plyometrics and stuff aside, that's right. really good stuff. But they'll say, well, you know, so I'm not adding any more weight on the squat, but I feel like it's feeling better. Like, maybe <laughs> that's the case. Maybe. Right? Maybe that's slack, the case. But maybe it's not the case. It's probably me, not the case. <laughs> it's probably not the case. If I, if my objective metrics of just being able to do more weight or more reps or whatever the sport demands – isn't there i'm starting to be concerned as what the fuck i'm doing and, and right. a lot of times and this is maybe for another discussion but i coach uh or program for a lot of folks doing hypertrophy training and there people will ask me like how do i get a big back and i'm like what is your current best you know top set or top three sets of weighted pull-ups and or barbell bent rows done strict and they say it and i'm like if you put 25 pounds on both of those lifts slowly over time you can't escape having a big back but they're looking for another answer they're looking for like well yeah. maybe it's my technique they want something this, easier say for sure and some of those things play a role but at the end of the day if your barbell row moves up by 25 50 pounds over several years you can't you there's no way to get out of that well, you and I can have a discussion about hypertrophy training sometime. I think uh, hypertrophy is uh, often gets thrown into some kind of little special category all by itself, but it's been my observation that if you take a guy from a 185 deadlift to a 495 deadlift, his back got bigger. A surprise, right? It, isn't that shocking? And, uh, it, it, we're, we're talking about sets of five. We're not talking about eight to 12, eight to 10, 12 reps of five to six different exercises. We're just talking about getting stronger because bigger is how you get stronger. And at first, that's all you need to do. 100%. And it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely, a, a, it'd be a good place to do our next little conversation about. Uh, sure. Mike, I appreciate you being with us today. Uh, you're a busy guy, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And stay in touch, and uh, we will pick up on this conversation later on. Sure. Thank you so much for having me on. We appreciate your being here on Starting Strength Radio. 